Well, it's good morning. It's good to see everybody at Hardison Baptist this morning. Let's get a song book and let's stand as we sing 364. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. this morning because he has paid the debt to make us free so thankful for the the shed blood of jesus christ on the cross i'm so thankful that we still sing the songs about the blood because that's what makes all this possible so thankful for the shed blood of jesus christ good to see you here at artisan baptist this morning i'd right, ask brother jim if you would open us in a word of prayer Father. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just a couple of quick announcements to keep it in front of you. I know it's been on the board or on the screen, and also you've got it in your bulletin, but um, weekly ladies' Bible study, is that going to continue? Is Miss Finney? There'll be, ladies, there'll be information. Do you know something? Okay. So um, normally we have the weekly ladies' Bible study at 
10 o'clock, 10.30 on Tuesdays. And uh, with Miss Beverly out of town, uh, with Mr. Ricky's health and all, we'll see how y'all will, y'all will find out, So, uh, you ladies. So uh, Wednesdays, 7 o'clock here in the auditorium for the adults. And then also uh, back there in the fellowship hall, I think it's where the kids meet. So be in your place for that. And bring, bring some kids. I know they'd love to uh, have them with them back there. Uh, daylight savings time ends um, next weekend. Hard to believe it's already there. And then a week from this Tuesday is election day. Uh, we, don't, we don't get into politics here at church, but at the same time, we are Americans. Please vote. And please vote the Bible. It's not just a presidential election. Educate yourself on our local elections because those have a lot of impact on where we live here and on state elections. Please educate yourself. Try not to get... There's too many, too many things online that can help us know what we're going to be voting on. Just do your homework and be able to pull those things up online. If you can't find them, have somebody help you find them. Um, should be anybody under 30 should be able to help you find them. <laughs> Just say it. Most people that yeah, these are... Uh, can find those things, but just vote. Make sure you do that. Make sure you are educating your right as a citizen of the United States and what a blessing it is to be able to do that. Um, so make sure you, you put that on your calendar. Make sure you, you're building up to that. Uh, November 17th, Thanksgiving dinner on the grounds after the AM service. And then uh, on the 24th, see we'll be decorating the church at 5 p.m. with a meal. And then uh, you see Thanksgiving Day on the 28th, but just some things Coming up there, make sure you're putting them on your calendar. Daniel Peacock has a birthday this week. So happy birthday, Daniel. How old will you be, Daniel? Nine. Nine. The last year of single digits, buddy. Are you serious? You, I just went through that whole spill about single digits, and now you were wrong. Okay, he'll be ten. So you're, you'll be done with single digits in just a couple of days. You'll never go back to those, by the way. Just think about that. So let's sing happy birthday to Daniel this morning. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. So, and <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so happy birthday to Daniel uh, on later this week. So excited for that for him. Uh, we had men's meeting yesterday. We had ten men, and so we had plenty of food, and, and it went really well. And Bruce taught the lesson and did an excellent job. So thank you, brother Bruce. Uh, we have found a hidden talent. So uh, I, I told him he was supposed to be preaching next week, but he he looked at me real funny. But. Uh, but no, it was a blessing. He did a great job. And so, uh, men, if you were there, you know it. You enjoyed it. Um, but if you weren't, uh, we're going to, uh, the plan right now is to delay men's meetings and ladies' meetings until January just because it's going to be busy for all of us during November and December. But uh, that's all the announcements I have. So let's continue our song service, Brother Charles. Come and have a good time at church and, and, uh, and all so let's uh keep continue lifting the praises up to God to page 308 nothing but the blood what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me
turn to page 366.
627. Charles, Miss Donna, thank you for being flexible, Miss Donna. You're just, just flowing with us. Take your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 7. <clears throat> Mark chapter 7. Just kind of continuing on. I started a few weeks ago in Mark 6 and just, uh, just felt like moving on through Mark as the Lord leads. Um. <clears throat> If your memory serves you really, really well, this will sound familiar from back in August. We looked at the Matthew sister pa passage to this, if you want to call it that. Uh, but I didn't want to skip this because, it, because we looked at it a few months ago in a different passage. But in Mark chapter 7, I want to start off <clears throat> in verse 1. And let's just read a few verses and talk about it and then uh, kind of continue on as the Lord leads and so forth. So Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. 
And when they saw some of his disciples eat with defiled, eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? That's a good question. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we could spend in your word this morning. Lord, thank you for the song service. I pray that it was in a, good, a sweet smell and savor to you. I pray that our hearts were in tune with just singing worship songs to you. Lord, just thank you for your, your... You allow us to live in a free country still that we can come and worship you, and we thank you for that. Help us not to take that for granted. Lord... We thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ that makes all of this possible. Lord, I pray that as we spend a few moments in your word, that you would just calm our hearts, allow us to hear from heaven this morning. Lord, may the Holy Spirit work in each one of our hearts individually, and may we be drawn closer to you because of it. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So in this passage, what we've read so far... You kind of can't read this and not chuckle just a little, right? Here are the the Pharisees. They see the disciples and Jesus. It says in verse 2, And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. Now, COVID (laughs) taught us the importance of washing hands, okay? Washing our hands did not become only necessary in 2020. Some of you were good at that before 2020, before COVID. But when, when we wash our hands, what are we doing nowadays? What are we doing? Well, we're trying to get rid of germs, okay? You don't want to carry germs and, and stuff. They say that, uh, by the way, I don't deal with cash anymore. I don't know what that is. Everything seems to be going through debit cards and things or credit cards. But I have heard that cash, just as a side note, is dirtier than a toilet seat. Just saying. So when you touch that cash... You're getting germs. What should you do? You should wash your hands. That's a good public service announcement. And how should we wash our hands? Soap and water for 20 seconds. Y'all are, y'all are over here going, what's he going to say next? <laughs> for, <laughs> for 20 seconds or sing the happy birthday song twice. Y'all, y'all, y'all know what I'm saying. Y'all aren't. There's only a few of you looking at me with your head cocked sideways. You know what I'm saying. 20 seconds gives you the, the, uh, the amount of time to, clean, to kill the germs and get them off your hands. Let me just clarify something. What the Pharisees were doing here, what they called washed hands or, or defiled hands, when they say they, when they went to the market, they couldn't eat unless they washed their hands, they, they didn't do anything without washing their hands, their washing of hands in this culture was not 20 seconds with soap and water. It was literally like baptizing them into some water. What did, Brandy, what did that just do? Absolutely nothing. It got your hands wet. They weren't literally washing their hands. They were just dipping them. And it says in their cups and brazen vessels and, 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 and those things. It wasn't like a disinfection thing. It was just a ritual thing. And then the Pharisees themselves, I love that they call it this. It says in the last part of verse 5, we'll just read the whole verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples 
according to the tradition of the elders. Like I say, some of this may sound deja vu from back in August. But that's a bad thing, y'all. When we take and we claim that we are walking according to the traditions of men over what the Bible says. Does the Bible ever say anything about not washing your hands? No. I think you can find it in Le- Leviticus 15 that it is important. But the Pharisees know what this is. It's a tradition of the elders. It's something that has been made up by man to help make people seem more religious. Think about this with me. I'm a Pharisee, hypothetically speaking. I come back from town, from the market, and as I'm walking into my house, probably a bowl outside of the house, what do I do? (laughs) And then they say, now I may eat. I am clean. I am not defiled. I'm glad they feel better about themselves. But they're not. They didn't just kill any germs. They didn't just do anything that was pleasing to the Lord, in my opinion, because it is a tradition of the elders. And we must be careful that we don't allow traditions to take over our lives. Now, I didn't plan on getting heavy on traditions since I did back in August. But the fact is, we got to be careful in what we're adding to Scripture. See, the Pharisees made up these traditions of the elders, generally speaking, to help clarify God's Word. To help people to, that maybe couldn't read or didn't have access to the scrolls. And they said, well, the scrolls say this, but let's just help them understand better and just help them to know to do this. If they do all these things, we'll fill in the blanks. We'll be the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I don't think they thought that. But we know the Holy Spirit that indwells us as believers teaches us. He shows us what what Scripture means. And you say, well, sometimes I don't understand. That's okay. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not in you or not showing you or not teaching you. But He's also given us a, Brother Scott referred to it this morning, a brain. He wants us to think and study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. We We need to be in God's Word. Well, Brother Ryan, I don't teach here at Hardison, so... Uh, I, don't, I don't need to prepare and study. Well, how else are you going to know God's Word? It's not just for teachers or preachers to spend time in God's Word and to study it and to learn it and to know it. Last week, I, I, I banged on the pulpit a little when I said we need to know God's Word. There's no excuse. We need to know it. Why? That I might not sin against God, but also so we can share it with others. I was able to talk to a young lady this week about the Lord, and let me just, I'm not saying anything for, for my glory, this is all God's glory, but if I had, when I talked to her, if I didn't know any verses, I would have been a babbling fool. Um, 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 the, the Bible says uh, uh, somewhere in Romans that uh, we're, we're all sinners. Um, hang on, let me, let me call Brother Jim. Let me call Brother Scott. Let me, let me call somebody. Can I do you the lifeline? No, it's Romans 3, 10 and 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But yet, then I wanted to tell her, but, but God died for us. Romans 5, 8. It says, oh, now I'm going to mess up the beginning of the verse. Put myself on the spot. But God commendeth his love toward us. I did have to go use a lifeline. 
in that, while we were yet sinners, thank you, Brittany, Christ died for us. But he didn't just die for us. He also rose again. But listen to Romans 6, 23. Anybody know that one? Why can I not start these verses? For the wages. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to stay over here. For the wages... <laughs> Would you say it, Miss Sandra? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We should know these and many more verses without the help of Miss Sandra and Brother Jim. <laughs> but thank you. We should know these verses so you can share it with other people. I've told people before that when I was in college, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating, and I'm also I'm not bragging because I don't remember a lot of these because I haven't stuck with it. I bet I memorized over a thousand verses because they make you memorize Scripture at Bible college, as they did when I was there. That's a good thing. You know the ones I remember the most? The ones that when you got to the end of the semester, the teacher said, oh, by the way, any verse I've given you this semester for memorization could be on the test. Oh, couldn't you narrow it down? So I had to, I had to go over them, learn them, memorize them. And when you know the Word of God and somebody tries to bring up a tradition of the elder, you can go, it doesn't sound right. Something about that doesn't sound right. We should be able to identify false teachings. I've heard it said before that, that uh, those that want to pre- in the government that want to prevent and, and identify false money or fake money or counterfeit money, there's a word, what do they do? They study all the fake money in the world. Miss Donna's shaking her head. No. What do they study? The real money. They know it inside and out, backwards and forwards. And then when somebody presents a bill that is not real, they look at it and they go, something's not right about this. How do they know? Because they know the real one so well. Spend time in God's Word Don't let tradition of elders, as these men tried to do for years and years, just fooling the people, telling them that they don't need to read the Bible for themselves. They don't need to read those scrolls. I got you. I'll show you what you need to know. Study your Bible. Know your Bible. Know the Bible stories. Know know these things so that you can... Have it, the, the, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So these traditions of elders, these, they're, they're, not, they're not meant some words. They're saying your disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. And we're offended. And Jesus said, really? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Look at verse 6. And he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. You know, Jesus took it right to them. And he said, I'm glad you brought that up. I want to tell you what's going on here. And he knew Scripture. He knew Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. And he quoted it to them. And he said, you're the ones that was prophesied about 700 years ago about. And you're the one that's the hypocrite. You see, you serve God on the outside. Your lips say the right things. Your feet go to the right places. But your heart is far from me. Man, have you ever known a Christian like that? 
See, I did the air quotes. Those are discouraging when someone claims to know Christ. They know all the words to say. They know the right things to do. But in their heart, they're just, they're just not right. Maybe they've never had a true heart transformation. Maybe they, just, maybe they grew up in church and just know all the right answers. But God knows the heart, doesn't He? He knows the truth about their standing with Him. But he claims, Jesus claims here, He says, This is what you're doing. You're giving me lip service, but your heart is far from me. Verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him to and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father and or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such thing like things do ye. He said, Let me give you an example. He said, You you know what the word of God says. It says to honor your father and your mother. Let me read you a footnote from Life Application Bible. It's from over in Matthew chapter 15 on this sister passage. And it says, This was known as the law of Corban. Anyone who made a Corban vow was required to dedicate money to God's temple that otherwise would have gone to support his parents. Corban had become a religiously acceptable way to neglect parents circumventing the child's responsibility to them. Although the action, giving money to God, seemed worthy and no doubt conferred prestige on the giver, many people who took the Corban vow were neglecting God's command to care for needy parents. These Pharisees were ignoring God's clear command to honor their parents. He says... You know that the Bible said, that Moses said, the law says, you should honor your father and mother. Yet y'all come up with this little thing, this little thing, this little vow called Corban, that means you, the money you would have used to take care of your parents in their old age when they're needy, you are dedicating it to the church. You're giving it to God. Hey, is that a good thing? Is it a good thing to give money to the church, to, to give it to the Lord? I believe so. The Bible is very clear about that. But when we're neglecting a scriptural commandment to do so, God is not honored in that. You remember when King Saul was told by Samuel to go into, and I didn't prepare for this, so forgive me for not knowing the references. He was told to go into the city and to kill everything. He said, kill it all. I want you to just clean house. That's the command God's given you. And Saul said, right on. We're after it. So he goes. They go, the warriors and all go into this town. And they go in and they end up killing a bunch of people. But they save the king alive and bring him back with him. And then they bring back a bunch of sheep, a bunch of animals that they said, oh, this will be good. And, so, and Samuel comes to Saul and says, hey, uh, How'd it go? Oh, it went well. Went well, sir. He was like, really? Who's that? Oh, that's the king. Thought it, we thought we'd bring him back. Like a hostage. What's this bleating of the sheep that I hear? Oh, well, we, we, we brought back. He's probably starting to. Stutter a little bit at this time. Oh, well, well, I mean, well, you know, you know, I mean, we, we brought back the best of the sheep because we can sacrifice those to God. And Samuel, I picture Samuel, a little bony guy. 
real small. Remember we talked about he had that he had that bony finger we talked about when it came to David. I feel like he pointed it in David's face and said, "Thou art the man." But he's a little bony guy. That's what I'm picturing. Samuel or Saul, we know, is a is a very large man, taller, head and shoulders above everybody else. We heard in the, we read in the Bible this, you know. So Samuel is up here, and or Saul's up here. Too many S words there. He says, uh, Saul says, "Oh well, you know, I mean, you know, we, you know, we could sacrifice those to the Lord because because sacrifice is good." God likes sacrifice. And little Samuel standing there, probably not saying a word, while Saul is going, right? I mean, yeah, good, right? And little Samuel is going. Saul, let me tell you something. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. And at that time, Saul was probably like, is it hot in here? I mean, it was, it might turn on, open a window or something. Whew. Because he's uncomfortable because he knows he has disobeyed the word of the Lord. Did the word of the Lord say we should sacrifice the best of animals? Yes. But what was God's word through Samuel to Saul? Wipe it all out. Don't save the king. Wipe it all out. All the animals, wipe them all out. And Samuel and Saul said, I don't know. I think I, I think I got a better idea. I think I've got a tradition of the elders I want to start. I want to save the best for sacrificing to God. Do we in our lives justify things that we're doing? They're good things that we're doing, but do we justify them because that's what we want to do? You know, when I was when we were raising our boys, I was very active here at Hardison Baptist Church. A youth pastor, part time youth pastor, deacon, taught Sunday school and stuff. And I felt like that was very important. Was it? Of course it was. But I really feel like I put that above the things I should have been doing as a husband and a father. But I felt like, you know, Brandy, but if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? If I don't plan that youth activity, if I don't uh, do this or do that, who's going to do it? And she was very polite over those years. I felt like I knew I was not doing the right thing, but... Guess what most people saw? Me in my suit, in front of the church, or in front of the youth group, or doing this or doing that. And I think I missed the mark on on many occasions, not all the time. But I should have been a better husband and father. Instead of putting so much stock in well, i got to serve the Lord. No, Bryant. God called me to be a husband and a father before he called me to be a youth pastor or deacon. But see, if I would have gotten my priorities right, guess what? All that fits together. It's not one or the other. It all fits together. Are we justifying something we're doing for God and saying... I feel like, you know, husbands, there's a lot of jokes about the women are always right. A lot of jokes. And it is funny. It's fun to laugh at. My wife and I watch jokes like that and, and just little marriage things and all. And, and let, let me say this. What is our wife to us, husbands? Our helpmate. We need, and, and, I'm, and I'm just saying this from experience, sometimes we should listen to our wives. <laughs> Came the female voiced amen. <laughs> sometimes we should listen to our wives. Who's in charge of the home, according to the Bible? The men are. 
That's not a power kick. That's not us going, woman, I'm the boss here, and what I say goes. No. The Bible says when we become married, we become what? One. If you neglect any part of your body, is it obvious? Yeah, I mean, Brother Scott mentioned this morning in Sunday school, we all looked in the mirror. I was waiting on you to say, well, most of us, <laughs> and let somebody be like, what I do? <laughs> if we neglect any part of our body, people know. Two become one. We should listen to our wives. It doesn't mean we should obey our wives. I don't mean that in a, in a cold or snarky way. And Facebook may be eating this up. The AI is probably all over this. But it's a partnership. We do it together. But the final decision rests on us, husbands. And we should listen to our helpmate. Now, what are we doing in our service to the Lord? Is it overcoming something that we should be doing that's more important, that God says is more important? I'm not going to try to get into examples other than what I've already done. You know what God might be putting His finger on in your heart and your life. But are we justifying, Brother Scott, I'm just going to, why don't you sit further up front so I could just, you could be right here, I could just. Brother Scott's very adamant in, the, in Sunday school about sharing the gospel. But do we justify away not sharing the gospel because, ah, uh, I don't know, what would they think? How would they receive it? What would they say? I know all these excuses because I use them in my own head. When the Holy Spirit said, hey, go share the gospel with them. <laughs> That's a receptionist in the doctor's office. I mean, it's quiet in here. What if she says, no? she, oh, she's on the phone. She's busy. Oh, she's off. Oh, that didn't last long. We should be willing to do what God's Word says to do and not allow the tradition of elders. And I say, I keep referring back to that. And you go, well, what are some of those traditions of elders? There's a lot of traditions that are different for you than they are for me that we can allow to usurp God's authority, and that's not what He wants us to do. Jesus quoted out from Isaiah 29, 13, we mentioned earlier, and He said that your heart is far from me. He goes on, and we already read it, where He said we should honor our father and our mother. But you say Corban, and when they do that, they're saying, I don't have to take care of my family because I'm giving this money to the church. I'm giving it to God. Who sees that? Everybody sees it. Well, I, I made the Corbin valuable. I came down front last Sunday and I said, Pastor, I'd like to make the Corbin vow. Amen. Listen here, church, we got somebody who's making the vow to give their extra money to God. Amen. But in order to do that, Pastor, I'm just going to be real blunt with you. I'm going to have to neglect my parents and my family members in their need because I'm going to give my money to God. But God can make more money, right? Let's not justify these things that we have conjured up in our hearts and think that God's going to bless it because, well, it was a good idea. I made a vow. I said, I'm going to do this. It's a good thing to give money to God. Jesus said, you've neglected the commandment of honoring your father and your mother, and you knew you were doing it when you, commit, when you vowed that. Let's don't get caught up in these things that help us justify not doing God's word and not doing God's will. I'm going to stop there. We'll pick up, Lord willing, next time and f finish out this passage of Scripture that gets deeper into, Jesus says, 
back to the hand wash. He goes, he kind of goes off the, the uh, Corbin law thing and back to the hand wash. And he says, you know what? When, we, when someone eats with defiled hands, it's not what goes in the body that defiles them. He says what? It's what comes out. And that's, some, that's just because it, it's 11, 52, 53, and I don't want to start on that and not be able to give it the right justice. But here's, here's what I say. It, it's not these traditions. Don't let them keep you from serving God how you know God wants you to serve Him. How you know the Word of God says to serve Him. And then foreshadowing to next time, it's not what goes in the body that defiles us. It's what comes out. Because when it comes out of our body, as far as thoughts and actions and words, it's coming from our heart. We watch these political candidates. You can't not if you turn on the television at all. And you say, oh my goodness, I can't stand either one of them. I understand that. What comes out of their mouth and their actions shows their heart. But we have a privilege to vote. Oh, well, I'm just not going to vote. They're just not a good candidate out there. Shame on you. Ask God how He should have you vote in the next week and a half, early voting or not. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not even going to tell you who I'm voting for. But in our hearts, what are we doing? Are we justifying away God's Word? Do we say, well, Corbin, ah, sorry, sorry, God, I can't serve you in that capacity because, Corbin, you know what God's put in your heart. You know what God's touching on in your life. I trust that you'll follow His leading, that you'll, you'll take that hand that's holding on to whatever you're holding on to and you'll say, Lord God, take it from me. Take this from me and use me. In whatever capacity you see fit. Musicians, musicians, if you'll come at this time. I want to have a word of prayer and then open up the, the altar here for you to have an opportunity to come hear the word, to, to come kneel down in, a, as has been said, a good old fashioned altar. But also you can do this in your seat as well. Do business with God. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Father, we thank you for this time we could be together. Thank you for this passage in Matthew chapter 7. Lord, that our hearts would not be so distracted by traditions of the elders. That we wouldn't get caught up in these things that we feel like are important, but they're actually adding to Scripture. They're keeping us from being truly involved and truly submitted and truly surrendered to you. Lord, I pray that you take the Word of God this morning that's been given and use it for your honor and your glory. Thank you for all that are here. I pray that you work in our hearts. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. 385.
quickly drives it away Not a doubt nor a fear Not a sign nor a tear Can abide while we trust and obey Trust and obey For there's no other to trust and hope.